Hello, my name is Arnaud Delorme, and I'm the main developer and software architect of the EGLab software for processing electroencephalographic data. So in this series of video, I'm going to show you why we develop EGLab and what's the theory behind EEG and how to uh, some basics about using EEGLab. In this first part, I'm going to explain the reason why we developed EEGLab and historical ERP, event-related potential approach and its limitation. So human electrophysiology was discovered in 1926 by Hans Berger, who was a psychiatrist in Germany. When he was young, at about 20 years old, he had an experience where he fell off his horse and uh, his sister had an intuition that something happened to him and she asked their father to send a telegram. This had a very strong influence on him. He thought there was some experience of telepathy and that's what pushed him to uh, record brainwave and see what's happening in the brain. So this is an example of his early uh, recordings. And then the, some other EG milestone uh, in the 20th century were uh, the first analysis of spectral analysis of EEG. And then 1962, the first computer for EVO potential averaging, or CAT. And uh, this really was the onset of the event-related potential averaging this era. And what happened with this computer is that it wasn't a digital, uh, it was a digital computer, but it was recording EEG, it wasn't recording the raw data. It was just averaging on the fly, uh, separate trials. So people didn't have access to the raw data. They couldn't do spectral analysis. They can do any kind of advanced analysis. They could only look at the event-related potential averages, and they could only try to interpret these. So this has, this was the onset of the whole era of event-related potential averaging, where people try to interpret the peaks of the ERP very often. Uh, in the same way that they would interpret reaction time as an uh, additional measure. So at that stage, people are not necessarily interested in what is happening in the brain. They just use this as an additional measure of uh, behavior. Then in 1979, there was the first source recognition of EEG and MEG. And this was the start of the era of functional EEG brain imaging. In 1995, the first multi-source EEG filtering by ICA to remove artifacts and, uh, and separate sources. And in 2009, the first commercial dry electrode device. So this is just a short history of, uh, of EEG over the years. And we're really going to focus on this first era, which uh, pushed, uh, was uh, on which most of the research was done until recently and see how we can go beyond event-related potential averages. So first, if you don't know what uh, event potential are, uh, I'm going to try to explain that. In this slide, for instance, so you have um, a cap. Here is, it's a dummy, uh, but you have many electrodes on the cap that records that, uh, potential over time, and then you present stimuli to subjects. So here you have two types of stimuli, the blue ones and the red ones. And uh, these can be sounds, these can be images of different types. So that's why here we have blue and red, different types of stimuli. And then once you have acquired the data, you can do offline processing. So for instance, the type of offline processing you would do are uh, event-related potential averages. So you take one electrode, for instance here, the uh, last one, and then you slice the signal around the stimulus of interest. So either the blue one or the red one. And then you remove the baseline, so that's the part that's just preceding the stimulus, and then you average all the blue ones and all the red ones for one electrode of interest. So for instance here, the last one. So this is the period where you would remove the baseline. And that's what's represented here. So then you have an average for both the blue and the red, and then the average might be different. And then you try to interpret the difference, especially the post stimulus peak that might be different. So the types, uh, here is another example. So this is different trials, trial one, two, three, up to N. And then you, you, you just average the single trials and then uh, try to interpret 
the latency and the height of the peak. So this is the historical uh, average ERP approach. These are typical peaks which are usually observed. Uh, you can notice that the, the scale on the y-axis is actually inverted. That's the standard format for looking at ERP, although some other people put it uh, in the opposite direction. And typically you have uh, peaks which are named P1, N1, P2, N2, P3, N400. And P1, for instance, is the positivity at 100 millisecond. N1 is the negativity at about 100 millisecond, P2 positivity at about 200 millisecond, N2 negativity at about 200 millisecond, P3 positivity at about 300 millisecond, although here we see most often the P3 peaks at about 400 millisecond. And you would do, look at this for different types of stimulus. So a typical experiment you'll have, uh, for example, a frequent stimula stimulus and a rare stimulus. So if it's sound, for instance, it could be beep, 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 boop, beep, beep. And so the rare stimulus tend to elicit what's called the P3, so the P300, so that's in, in, in red here. And 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 in, you also have differences in the other, uh, potentially in the other ERP peak, the N100, uh, N1. Um, and then you can also look at the difference between the two curve. And when you look at the difference, there's other peaks which are interpreted in the literature. For instance, here, when we look at the difference, we have the MMN mismatch uh, negativity for audio sound. So these are typical ERP analysis and the assumption is that the data, the EG data, is equal to an average plus some background noise and you just have to remove the background noise. And for the EG is equal to the ERP plus some EG noise. But this linear decomposition is only true if the average appears in every single trial and the background is not perturbed in any way by the event which is uh, presented. And so this is, uh, this is what EG Lab is about. Is, about. is this assumption true or is it not true? And I'll show you in the next few slides just example that show that it's not always true. And most often it's, it's not true. So the first tool here, uh, one of the tools we developed in EG Lab is called ERP Image. And that's a way to look at the single trials. So this is one trial, and you can see the potential, the activity of uh, uh, the EG activity. That's for one electrode, and this can be color coded in this in in the sense that blue here is going to be negative potential, and red is going to be positive potential. You can do that for several trials, and then you can stack them up to uh, create what's called what we call an ERP image. So uh, by default, they're sorted by uh, time on task, first trial, second trial, etc. But you can also find different types of sorting. So for instance, these are about 400 trials unsorted. And the red, the black uh, trace here represents the reaction time of the subject. Now what we can do is we can sort the trials by the reaction time of the subject. And that's what represented here. And what we can do also is to see better the, the evoked activity is that we can smooth the trial uh, across the uh, y dimension. And so that's what represented here. And then we can see pattern emerging. And in all the cases you see in the bottom uh, of each of the plot, the event related potential is exactly the same. We just reordered the trials, but we can see much more information in the sorted and smooth ERP image that we can see uh, in the ERP. So how can you use that information? Well, um, so in, in this example, for instance, this was a task, this was a visual task, and this is the uh, distractor trials for the visual task. And here the trials are sorted not by reaction time, they're sorted by the phase of alpha. And here, uh, these, these trials are only the trials with the highest alpha power. And usually alpha power, when you do standard even related potential analysis, you remove all the trials with alpha. 
because you consider alpha as strong background noise so you don't want to you don't want to be con your data to be contaminated with these trials so these are the trials with highest alpha sorted by alpha phase and these are the trial with lowest alpha sorted by alpha phase and according to the standard ERP hypothesis alpha is background noise uh, whether you pick up the trials with the highest alpha or the lowest alpha, it shouldn't influence the ERP. But what we see here is that the ERP is actually very different for uh, trials uh, with high alpha versus uh, low alpha. And so the assumption that the background noise activity is independent of uh, the stimulus is not going to be affected by the stimulus in these cases is not verified. Uh, here is another example of what you can you do with using this kind of technique. Uh, this is uh, this is the same task, and here uh, what we looked we looked at the the targets, and um, here is the ERP for one frontal channel. It's actually below the eye, so we spend a lot of time removing artifacts, and we're looking at the ERP of this of this uh, channel, so in red, and we're looking at the ERP image. So this is the ERP image and sorted by reaction time. So the dotted line is uh, represents reaction time. And then we, what we can do here, we can also align the trials based on the response of the subject instead of the stimulus. So that's what's represented here. So this is the same data, just aligned differently on the response. And then what we looked at is we looked at the slope of uh, the activity preceding the response. And what we observed is that the slope was proportional to uh, the reaction time. So again, if you just look at the average, this is completely invisible in the average. You have to look at the single trial. So you have to look beyond the event-related potential average. Another way to look beyond the event-related potential average is to look at spectral power changes. So uh, this is a representation of a time frequency decomposition. And we define the baseline as having uh, zero, um, zero activity. And then you can see that post-stimulus, post so after a presentation of stimulus, you have an increase in, uh, in brainwave amplitude here, in that case, in the theta for about four hertz, four to six hertz time frequency range. And then again, after uh, after about 600 milliseconds, a decrease in, in brainwave amplitude. So again, that's not visible in the ERP, and that's another way of looking at the uh, data. Here, this is um, here's a more concrete example. This was a task where we asked people to count their breath, and whenever they lose the count, they have to press the button. So this is the, at zero is the button press and before zero is when they lost the count and after zero is when they're uh, regaining concentration and starting to do the task again and again we see a very clear pattern here of inversion between alpha and theta and this type of uh, analysis um, you can't when you just look at ERP you can't see any of this uh, brain uh, dynamics here another one another representation so this is still time frequency decomposition and then in single trials we look here at the correlation of the brainwave amplitude with reaction time and then we can see that uh, we have a strong correlation between uh, uh, amplitude and reaction time that's actually a negative correlation and this correlation is preserved even when we remove the ERP so we go in every single trial and we do what's called regress out the ERP. We find the, the ERP that best match in amplitude the single trial, and we remove that. And we can see that even in that case, we have the activity is still uh, present. So that what we were observing was indeed depending on the event-related potential average. So this, are, this is the reason why we developed EEG Lab, is to really apply more advanced uh, signal processing methods to EG signal and go beyond the ERP model. You can see here in this plot uh, the number of citation for EG, ERP, and uh, brain oscillation and the evolution over the year. So in, in the 1960s, you had the first CAT uh, 
system, which I mentioned previously, and, and the rise of the ERP era. And, and uh, in about the 80s, you had event-related desynchronization, so that's spectral analysis of, the, of EEG. Then uh, in the 1990s, EEG, ICA and ERSP, event-related spectral perturbation, so that's the plot I showed before, the, the spectral plots. And EEG that was created in the year 2000 and contributed to uh, this change. So in the next video, series of video, I'm going to show you where the EEG uh, signal comes from and uh, what you can do with EEG Lab.